Well, good morning. Um, I'm Bill Harper. I'm Pastor Chris's dad. You all know who we are, and this is Linda Gustafson. And by the way, we are SWC's newest engaged couple. <laughs> so, so mark your calendars, September 16th, 34 days, by the way. <laughs> uh, September 16th, and you're all invited to our wedding. It'll be right here at the church with a reception to follow. So make sure you mark your calendar, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we are delighted to be able to, uh, for Linda to read the word this morning. If you're able, if you will stand for the reading of the word, she's reading from Jeremiah uh, chapter 29, verses 4 through 14. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord, on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. <clears throat> For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. May God add his blessings to his word. You may be seated. Since uh, June began the series, and we're going to uh, take a little bit. We've got a couple more one, weeks. We're going to spend uh, the last two weeks of the series is going to be on, out of visions from Revelation. And uh, so we really want to be looking forward to that. But this week, get a little pause, chance to uh, regroup, talk a little bit on the practical of how we can help Scripture, how God would have us rightly interpret visions and dreams. And uh, this is going to be an opportunity kind of just to unpack things a little bit. But we're going to, we're going to do it out of taking time for teaching from Jeremiah 29, and that's part of kind of like the little little bit of the, the, the message part, the teaching part from Jeremiah 29. In, in particular, was Jeremiah dealing with the exile, the those that had been taken, Israelites have been taken out of, uh, that have been taken into captivity from Jerusalem. We'll talk, Jen's going to, Jen's going to kind of take the, the, the Bible study part of it, um, and then we're going to get into the, uh, into the basics of it. But let me lead with this. I, I think this is a familiar term. You ever use this, thought about this? Uh, we hear what we want to hear. <laughs> Has anybody told you that? Like, yes, kind of in an accusatory yeah. uh, way, right? Um, did, is, did, did you, were you ever told that, Pastor Bob? A few times. A few times. But you were married how long? Don't forget your mic there. Yeah. Uh, how many years? From 1950. I think you were. To 2021. 71 years. So you were. Yes. I'm guessing you were told more than once. You hear what you want to hear. We see what we want to see. Like it's an age old issue. And we're going to see it here out of, out of the Israelites. But this is one of the, the great challenges. And certainly as it relates to things that are. In that spiritual realm and divine dreams and prophecies and words, like that is, there is, how many know we all have a little bias? <laughs> like we all come to the table with, with our experiences, right? right? And so um, 
we're gonna we're gonna unpack that because here's here's the part that that might pose the question for us. What forms those wants? Like we hear what we want to hear, we see what we want to see. What forms our wants? Like the the desires. What what kind of triggers that? Because um, all, so much of life. I'm I'm 53. Like I have a lot of a lot of history. Like there's been a lot of life, sweetheart. You. I mean, we would talk about that many times. And and how many times have you you told me when we when I got home? I'm like. Um, you'll look at me and realize I don't have anything in my hands and you were like, sweetheart, you said you were going to stop at the grocery store to pick up mm, something. Yes. And, and she's like <laughs> looking at me and I don't have anything in my hands. And I'm like, I don't remember it's very rare. actually telling it's you. It's very that. rare. Yeah. And then I would say, you hear what you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I did that once. Yeah, uh, yeah very rare. No. Uh, Talk about the bias thing real quick. Just. Yeah, I mean, because it's kind of a wide range. Sometimes I think it's things that, that kind of have their genesis in just like our personal, you know, our, like our personal preferences, things that are, you know, like, I don't like pineapple, you do like pineapple, like that kind of thing, right? Where it's, it's sort of innocuous, it's just, it's just a choice, where the things that we want are based on just part of how we're made, not good or bad, just what is. But then there's other things that can form our wants as well, and those can be, you know, the, the harder things, like the, the difficulties that we've been through and, and you know, traumas that we've experienced, um, those things can shape what we want. The flesh, our fallen nature, can shape what we want. Certainly, those things spring from that as well. Add, add to that, Pastor. Like yeah, the responsibility mm. that you have makes a whole different difference in how you look at things. And so when we talk about prophets and the responsibility they had to share the word of the Lord with their people, it takes on a whole different view than if you are the people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really right. And that can, I mean, there's a whole lot in that. And certainly, in fact, let's, let's go ahead and grab into, get into Jeremiah real quick and un unpack this. Sorry, she's, okay. Ah. <gasps> I'm going to remember. Let's, let's get into Jeremiah and unpack this, because uh, that, that's the, that's, that is definitely what is, is happening in this story. It so. really is. Yeah, the, the passage that um, Dad and Linda read for us so beautifully this morning. So some of it is pretty familiar. Like we're all probably have heard Jeremiah 29, 11 before, right? The context of, of that passage is this is a letter written by Jeremiah, and he's in Jerusalem to people who were in exile in Babylon. And this had been like the, the first deportation where Nebuchadnezzar came and long story short, basically siege, put a siege to Jerusalem and started taking the people of God away to Babylon because of their sin. So the, the whole context of this passage is people, essentially people who were in profound pain, like their worst case scenario has, has come to pass where they're being carried away from the land of promise and taken off into a foreign land, the last thing that they wanted has actually happened to them. So Jeremiah writes them this letter because he'd been warning them actually for about 30 years before this point that, you know, that God is going to raise up an enemy to come and oppress you if you don't turn your heart back to God because they were doing exactly what Pastor Christine opened with telling us about this morning their hearts had turned to other gods, and for about 400 years between the time of Solomon and David to this point where we are right now, that amount of time had passed. And the Israel, the, the people of God, had kind of done this up and down thing where they, were, they would serve God for a while and things were good, but then they'd fall back into idolatry. And it would happen back and forth and back and forth. And so they were serving other gods, and so God brought this about. So everything that Jeremiah had been warning them about now actually came to pass, and the Babylonians are at their front door. So how do they cope with this? So our text kind of gives us a, a clue here. So in verse 8, part of Jeremiah's word to the exiles in this letter that would have been sent to them in Babylon, um, it says this. It says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you there in Babylon, do not let them deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream." There's a really interesting kind of textual thing that's going on here, and some of your Bibles may have this footnote on that phrase, the dreams that they dream. It might say at the very bottom, your dreams which you cause to dream. 
So what's going on here is this idea that possibly the exiles were seeking out their own dreamers. Like they were not excited about God's word through Jeremiah. They did not like that because Jeremiah had been telling them, you're going away into captivity and it's going to be 70 years. So they were seeking out dreamers who would dream the kinds of dreams that they could get on board with, that they would like better, right? That were a little bit more, you know, easy, a little bit, a little bit softer than what God had told them. So the dreams that you caused to dream, this idea that they were seeking out prophets to tell them what they wanted to hear, kind of for a quick exit. Like, we can just get this thing moving. This whole exile thing will be out of here quickly. Yeah. Right? 2,700 years, we're still doing the same thing. Amen. Like, there is this propensity. I mean, it's, it's human nature, and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it. Like, I mean, who of us right. don't want the easy way out. Like, I mean, that's just, that's just driven, uh, built into all of us. So for generations, and Pastor Bob, I wanted to have you comment because Paul writes, we'll come back to, to the story in a moment, but um, Paul writes in 2 Timothy, and we'll just read this verse. Maybe, Pastor Bob, you can unpack this and start to bring in some of your wisdom and experience. Uh, for, the, for the time is coming. So this is Paul. How many years? Well, 700 some years later. For the time is coming when people will endure such sound teaching, will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, I always thought that's, a, that's just a, <laughs> a real descriptor, that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And pastor, I mean, isn't, I'm a, like, that's exactly what was happening with Jeremiah. It's happened, then Paul was dealing with it, and he was looking to a day like we're living in today, 2,000 years later. I think one of the things that we recognize right away is that we get certain things in our mind that we like to have happen. And so Israel had somehow so got fixated on the land, and they made it a idol for them. So they wanted to go back to the land more than they wanted to repent of what their sin was. And so when you start thinking about how that affects us today, a few years ago, Christianity took on a political party. That, that in itself does not fit well because we are a, as the Bible says, prophets unto the world not just our country. But we, we became those that began fixated by the fact that certain people or certain groups of people were more favorable than others. God does not look upon people that way. He looks upon each of us as individuals that need repentance. And so the prophets, when they speak, they're speaking what God says, not what they want. And it's so difficult sometimes to separate that yeah. because we begin to pray. We begin to feel like that that's what God wants. And all of a sudden, if you're not careful, you are speaking the dreams that they wanted to dream. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Amen. You know, Timothy writes in that referring to sound doctrine. And, um, and I think, I think we want to, depending on some of your tradition, your background, you, you might get hung up with the idea, does that mean I need to be a, you know, a, a seminary student, a Bible scholar, while doctrine seems kind of, you know, blasé, but the, the simplicity of what really sound doctrine is, is, is that which is most foundational of absolute truth. And usually what we find throughout really the generations we find today, it's not that people are throwing, they're, they're not publicly denying Jesus, though that exists. It's not, it's usually variations of just the sound doctrine, the Trinity, like, like the fact that scripture is absolutely true. And, and, you know, so you see these little compromises and they start forsaking sound doctrine, just what we did with communion. Like, um, People forsaking just the basic, forsaking the, the gathering together of the, of the um, 
body, the church, the body of Christ. Like these are all things. Like how many know that that literally we the church in the United States we're thirty percent less people are attending church regularly just since in the last five years. Thirty percent drop of frequency. So what is that? That's like something's happened. Somebody's somebody's lead, some of these things that are happening. Like it's this itching ear, it's adjusting to comfort, and that that goes across all. Self is self deception a good word? A very Maybe. good word. Yeah, self deception. Um, so let me let me just we'll just hang on this this and then I just give you some stuff, Pastor. I just we just want to learn from you tonight today. Visions and dreams. We see this with Jeremiah. They're often, not always, but they're often given to us as a warning. I don't know whether maybe you have any personal examples. Jen, Jen's got a couple. I've got a couple. But, the, but, but I think the thing we dare not forget when he's doing that, when God's given us that, it's for our protection and our help. So the Jeremiah 29, 11 that we quote so much, remember, yeah, it's not to bring harm to us, but in order to extricate us. But often it's the discomfort. It's the sting. Taking the sting out requires a little bit of pain sometimes. Yeah. I think also we need to realize that warning does not always mean bad. Warning okay. can be a very helpful thing to change your direction. Uh, I was pastoring in Watertown, South Dakota, and we had an evangelist in. And the evangelist at the end of the last service came up to me and he said, you're moving. And I looked at him and said, what do you mean? He said, I don't know, but I know you're moving. And so we had been there seven years. We'd built a church. We were happy. It was a wonderful congregation. And all of a sudden, you're moving. So I, we prayed about it for two days, and we got a phone call from Montana. And they said, you've been recommended as a pastor to come to Montana and take over a church up here. Are you interested? I said, well, we'll have to pray about it. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Five days later, I got a phone call from my home church, and they said, Pastor Dan Poling is going to be here on Friday night to speak, and I know that you're a close friend of his and his great Bible teacher, and why don't you come in for that service? So it was 200 miles to drive to there. We got a little late start, so we had to go in, and, and the service had already started, so we sat about halfway back in the congregation. He got up to speak, and he looked out over the congregation. He said, oh, I'm so glad to see Bob and Hazel here, because I want to tell you what happened. I was flying in from Oregon, and when I was passing over Butte, Montana, the Lord showed me stand that you and her were standing on the mountain. <laughs> Wow. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes <laughs> you don't realize that God is preparing you for a change. Yeah. Yeah. We want to be a sweetheart. You want to share any of your good examples? Yeah. So probably 12 years ago, I think this, this has not happened a lot. I mean, I've got maybe one or two times where I feel like there was something that the Lord was truly, you know, warning me about in a dream about 12 years ago. I had a dream that was, um, yeah, just warning me about a scenario that I didn't, wasn't in my current frame of life. I had really didn't understand it at the time. So I tried to, you and I, we just prayed, prayed about it and kind of held it before the Lord and said, okay, you know, we're just going to just hold this before you and, and you're going to work this out and, and whatever, you know, just make me aware if this, if this scenario comes to be. About 12 years later, it did. And some of the details were so specific that I, I remember the moment of remembering that dream and all these details kind of converging together. It was like, oh, wow. And, and it was so good because I think it, the Lord, it was a real gift because walking through it was, was a very difficult scenario. And the, and the scenario was a few years ago, but um, it was a real comfort to have had that dream because I, I could really hang on to the reality, and we know this, but sometimes the Lord just impresses it on our hearts a little bit more strongly that he has us, he's got us, and, and there's nothing that is going to come into our lives that he isn't filtering and organizing and superintending because um, there's parts of it that could have been very chaotic and very destructive, and he just uh, used it as a way to just kind of secure me 
um, in that situation. I'm very grateful. For yeah, that. I, uh, yeah, yeah. So God, so here's, here's the fundamental thing. In fact, um, could I uh, share, I think it's slide 16. Uh, it's, it's the one with the graphics. We, sh we showed that a while back. Um, and just, I'll just let this, let this play out for us. I think the thing we, we want to always remember, God is communicating. God wants to communicate to his people, and he's fundamentally done it through his word. So I think the challenge, and of course, that's part of the debate that's out there. Wait, God's already given scripture. Why do we need another word from the Lord? Like, right? And so there's, a, there's, there's this uh, too often a misunderstanding of, of a word that could in any way contradict scripture or that what God is actually using illumination for when he brings a vision or dream, how he would do that in our modern day. Um, not to replace the word of God, not even, could we say it this way, Pastor Bob? Not even to supplement God's word, never, because it's complete in the canyon, canon. But often there's the personal guidance that we need um, for, for ourselves or our family, you know. I think the, the place we have to be careful is if we substitute that for direction. Okay. It is a help along the way, but it is not given to us to follow that. We follow the word. Mm. The word is important. Yes, and I think that in the way the church is set up today, prophets would find a very hard place in order to minister because most churches are small, so that means they have to either work and just be part of the congregation, mm -hmm. or they are what we call independent. They're out there on their own, uh, very little uh, necessary to respond to other people's covering. And so it becomes a very difficult thing. And yet the Bible tells us definitely there are the five ministries. Yeah. So. We, we don't deny those things, but we recognize that there is difficulty in it. Yeah. And when you speak about prophecy and all of those things, remember that the Bible also gives us direction on how we respond to that. And that it's very necessary for us to learn how to respond to the word. And that says that we do it with two or three witnesses. We don't take something and run with it without going and passing it through the people that are maybe older than the, in the scriptures than we are, maybe yep. a better understanding of the scriptures, but we bring it in and we allow it to be looked at. Whenever it gets private and you start trying to protect something, it's out of order. <laughs> and usually dangerous. Oh, like, dangerous yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, would, would you say many of the pitfalls that have happened, a lot of, maybe even division in the church, potentially? In the late 40s and the early 50s, there was a great revival that moved through part of the country. It was a blessing. There was prophecy. There was a blessing. It, the, the Lord was moving in mighty ways. People were being healed and saved. And a group decided that it was their revival. And the only way you could be a part of that revival is if you went to Vancouver, Canada, and were signed in as a part of their group. <laughs> it divided churches all over the north part of the United States. So what, became, what was a blessing to start, mm. man grabbed a hold of it. So classic. And when he did, it went. <laughs> yeah, and so, yeah. So isn't, isn't that part of the warning, you know, the warning for us today? We know God's moving. We're praying God move. God move freely. Well, what's the answer? Like, like we're just going to abandon it? Because honestly, I've got a lot of my peer pastors, and, and Shruti, we've, we've talked about this in seminary, that it's like they don't want anything to do with this space because it's too, it's, honestly, it's too complicated. And so they, it's messy, good work. And, and so they, they would choose a safer space. But honestly, the answer, it is true. It's challenging. But we found part of the culture here. And Pastor Bob, you've been certainly part of the nurturing of my dad and Pastor Jim. Like working diligently to create a church, a, a culture by which these things can happen. But that requires accountability, which inquires, requires being in community. Like, 
like actually being in order. And honestly, it's there's a little bit of a reputation that SWC, we're so far from perfect. But here's what's cool. Healthy, healthy. Rather than toxic activities and extremes, we get to function in a way where the gifts can be able to flow, but it's going to require some of this accountability Absolutely. piece, being in community. So Jen, I'm just maybe come back to the story here real quick, because we, we like, we said this, we like the comforting words often, Pastor, sometimes more than warnings, not, give me a, give me a comforting word. I, somebody, it was Brother Norbert, you know, was just ministering to me before service, like, Bringing comfort, just a word of the Lord, like Amen. most, which arguably most of prophecies intended with that, right? Uh, Paul seems to bring that out in 1 Corinthians 14, that the prophet, when he speaks, let it be encouraging, let it be yeah. uplifting, yeah. all of those things. And that is true in the, in the congregation. I, I have difficulty when there is a lot of disruption in the congregation. I think things are done decently and in order. But instruction seems to come from the pastor with the word as his background. And so when you think about prophecy, as Paul points it out, it is to encourage, to strengthen the body. It's like family with mom and dad helping build up and nurture yeah. and and that that's that's the purpose of each other that's why back in the early days <clears throat> it was brother and sister <laughs> way back in my day somebody asked me where in the world did that come from the bible says that we are family and so it was easy to say brother and sister it's gone forever now, I think. <laughs> well, shoot, we, we even said greet each other in a holy kiss. Oh. <laughs> now we do hugs. <laughs> and then we had mass. And then all the, yeah, now we're not even like, now it's down the here. Fist bump. Fist bump. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we're family, right? We're yeah. family. And that's like, that's the way the, the church should, should function. So I... S- s- with, with Jeremiah, Jen, there, there's, we want to read things into what we want to hear. We can taint the interpretation often through our self-interest, so we want to be super careful. And, and again, one of the, one of the great, um, great needs is to be able to experience these moves of spirit within community, but it does require humility, a surrender. Really right. And I, it, it was, timing like is a big part of that it's, as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I feel like that's what's come up to here in the last few minutes is community and, and timing that we need to hold it before the Lord because we often don't know the timing of God, you know? So he's going to work this out. And we absolutely see those two things in, in our, this, this yeah. text. Chapter 28, we see Jeremiah doing prophecy in community with another prophet. As it, oh, did I just go? Okay. So, so chapter 28, which I realize is not our text, but if you want to look at it later, uh, there's this prophet named Hananiah who probably had crossed paths with Jeremiah. They didn't live that far away from each other, so likely they knew each other. But this prophet Hananiah is, is called out as essentially a false prophet, but he says that all the temple vessels, all the, all the stuff, the, the, the plate, the cutlery, the, the things the, from the temple that, that were carried off to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, he prophesies that it's all coming back within two years, and all the exiles are coming back in two years. And this is all in direct contradiction to what Jeremiah has been saying, you know, through the Spirit, all, you know, for these last however many times, since at least chapter 21 and chapter 25, Jeremiah had been telling them, it's going to be a long haul. You're going to need to settle in when you get to Babylon. This other prophet, Hananiah, says, no, no, it's going to be two years, and everyone's going to be back, and all the temple stuff is going to be back. So how does Jeremiah respond in this moment? This is really interesting, and it's kind of, right, absolutely, like, yeah, opposed to each other. Two words for the same group of people that are opposite each other, essentially. So we're going to see how Jeremiah behaves in this moment with absolute humility. And he essentially says, 
Well, you know, peace and security is a rare message. Generally, the prophets, in, at least in, in the, in the uh, Old Testament, they were not prophesying that because repentance is required. And Pastor Bob, you brought that up earlier, that there is the repentance that must happen before restoration. So Jeremiah basically tells the group, he doesn't, he doesn't confront Hananiah. He doesn't say, well, that's not what God told me. He just says, well, we're going to let God work this out. We're going to see what happens. And he just essentially holds it before the Lord. And then the Lord comes to Jeremiah later and says, go back to Hananiah and tell him you're wrong. And by the way, actually, Hananiah dies within two months because he was giving a false word to the people. But one of the things I just comment I want to make about prophecy and the gifts in community, and one of the things that I have certainly experienced in this family, is that even if, even if we blow it, even if we get it wrong, there's so much love here that we don't have to be afraid of that. And the elders and the pastors will gently and kindly correct and redirect us. And so um, I, I just appreciate that about this body very much, is that even if we get it wrong, there's still love to, to help us. I think that's a, that stands out in the fact that if you take responsibility for what you do and don't do, and, and if you're wrong, admit you're wrong. Be what? willing. What? Yeah, that's hard. What? That's hard. It's 2023, to man. Come on. But one of the things that I remember so much Good. from my growing up is that my father used to say to me, until you're willing to be responsible for what you say and do, you're not grown up yet. Yeah. You're still a child, and the Bible yeah. teaches it the same way. There are children among us yeah. that are learning, wow. and they're watching us. Do we take full responsibility for ourselves? That has legs, like so many, so many applications on that principle. Pastor, I've... I think it's fair to say well over a hundred prophecies that have been emailed to me, brought to me, um, that were, that were some, from some person that was either just barely connected with SWC or just literally driving by. And, you know, I, I think one of the challenges, especially in my younger days of ministry, was, you know, you, you want to hold everything very sacred and be, be, be reverent with you know, I know God can use a mule, right? So, like, he can use anybody to speak things. So I think we do it, but I, 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 I had to learn because some of it just messed with me, like, in an unhealthy way. It, like, made me insecure. It made me, like, I started looking for, for as it were, demons under every little pew kind of thing, whatever. And I, I, I really have, have sought to embrace the principle of what God actually intended for the church to look like, to be able to be in community, like, Words that are going to be given and tongues, messages, tongues, interpret all of those things. Man, don't be don't be a, a, a fly in, fly out person. Be part of the community. Let let the character be vetted. That way, the accountability can exist. And again, why all that matters is because it needs to be safe. God intends to speak, and He wants to bring health and build up His church. Right, not tear it down. And so we want to embrace that in a in a way that's honoring to the Lord. You get the prophecies, we got evangelists. Yeah, back in your day? Okay. Back in our day, it was always somebody was at your door saying, God told me I should come here and preach for a week. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 So there's all, you're always <laughs> dealing with something. That's yeah. why we share with each other. That's why we talk about yeah. what's happening. That's why we open up things that we don't understand. Is because none of us have the answer for everything. Real quick, I had a couple questions that came out here, and I, we've answered a few of them already indirectly. But um, one was regarding uh, was regarding the difference on dreams between literal and symbolic. And one of them, like that, that is a that is a unique difference. Do you have any wisdom on how you've been able to to, to filter that? Like, okay, I, I really have a sense the Lord was speaking, but I'm not sure is that literal or was that kind of metaphorical? Yeah, any any wisdom on how you've you've process no <laughs> but <laughs> okay i mean that's a hard i mean it's, it's what, honestly you know what i have attempted to do and that is by sharing with my best helper and that was my wife as to what she felt that it was actually saying yeah because my interpretation 
many times was looking at it from ministry side, she would be able to give mm. me the other side of it. Yeah, good. Uh, and, and she was a part of the congregation, so she would feel what the congregation was feeling rather than what I was feeling. And so I got the both sides of it. So that I tried so most of the time to make it literal. Uh, it wasn't always possible, so sometimes you just wait and see what God's going to do. <laughs> That's, like, it's okay to wait and see. Oh, absolutely. Like, that, the danger, so if I was just talking to one of our sisters that had a word um, several months ago, and she really held it before the Lord, and honestly, if she would have taken action immediately, because she didn't have the sense of it, there wasn't enough clarity for it, it would have totally made a mistake, but just in this last week, it, the timing was fully confirmed. Yes. And the coolest thing. So I, I, I strongly encourage that. Last, last little question, we interact, and then should our, have you close, close us out. Um, national words. Like, I, 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 I think that's a, you know, that's a thing we experience. I think, again, God can do what he wants to do. He wants to communicate. So... But, man, there is a lot of national words that are rolling out of the prophets. I, I, honestly, I, I get between 20 and 30 a week of national words from different prophets and different ministries, right? And so many of them have similar, uh, similar messages. Pastor, any, man, that's a, you know, we, we, we tend to, I, I, I like what you said there at the beginning. Too often, it's, it's, is the word myop, myopic, you know, where it's just very limited view. We're just thinking, thinking narrow. Um, how to discern national words, warnings, so often warnings. And he sits there with the, deep contemplation. <laughs> the Bible kind of gives us an idea, and that is time is always a part of anything that comes forth. Uh, it may be instant. It may be, like you say, a short time, or it may be 70 years. And so we don't always see the immediate. And I think that, and I hate to say it this way, but I don't know any other way to say it. When you hear something, remember what the world is teaching us now, and that is scams. Anything that gets you so excited that you don't think Clearly. Wow. That's just wisdom. Whatever it is. Money. You're in trouble. Drunk. Yep. So always remember that God is a God that loves you. And he's looking out for you. And the way that you can find that out is to spend some time in his presence and present it before him. Don't be dogmatic. Say, I don't understand this. I don't know why this is happening like this. God, I need your input. Don't be afraid to ask I him. <laughs> I love that wisdom. And don't be afraid to ask leaders. They may not have the answer, yeah. but they're going to go to prayer for you too. Guaranteed. So Guaranteed. those are the areas that we as people have to recognize that the enemy wants to disturb your peace. And once he takes away your joy and your peace, you are done. Yeah. Amen. Day of Pentecost, the message was preached from Joel. Young men, old men, your sons, your daughters, your, your, your servants, they're going to dream dream visions. Like, like the, uh, this is, we're in that season of grace right now. Yes. Like we're in a season of grace that is preparing for the final day. So everything God's doing is preparing us for that final day. And so there's always warning. I had somebody ask about, boy, you see all the devastation, the fires. And in Hawaii, you see earthquakes. I mean, what was it? Christmas, day after Christmas, the um, tsunami in um, uh, Indonesia. Like 200,000 people, you know, you are these judgments of God that are raining down. There is an aspect that earth, we have to remember this. Earth is groaning. <laughs> and it's happening, but there's one thing that's supposed to be a result of this. It's not to, we, we want to be so careful that we don't, um, you know, 
use, use tones or disparaging. Like, man, I, I remember the 80s, you know, the, there was a lot of terminology. That was the judgment of God. They were pointing out diseases and somebody dealing with stuff. That was the judgment of God. That's, that's because of the judgment of God that this happened. I think that's dangerous territory for believers. We, we operate with the, the knowledge that we are all... <laughs> The, 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 the day is coming. The final day of judgment is coming. But we're now in a time of grace where people are being drawn to God, not separated from him. There'll be a day when the separation happens, and that's the judgment. But right now, God's drawing people to us. Well, Jesus points to that. He said, were the Galileans that were sacrificed and killed by the Romans, were they worse than the other Galileans? <laughs> were those that the, temp- that the pillar fell on, were they worse than others? Yeah. You know, there, there is a judgment coming. We know that. We're well aware of that. But it's easy to follow the world who right now is very, very intent on karma, which means <laughs> if you do bad to me, you're going to get it. Interesting. And that is not necessarily what the scriptures that's, teach. That's not how it te- it's taught. Amen to that. Yeah, otherwise we are, um, yeah, we're, well, we're in a time <laughs> where God is calling us to be ambassadors for Christ. Absolutely. And that's like our calling. And in fact, if you want to talk judgment, am I right on this? Where it actually specifically says for this season, judgment begins where? It's the house of the Lord. Yeah, so if we want to talk that. Let's just look in the mirror like God's perfecting his church. And that's only for the perfecting purpose, not for separation. So final, final word here. So I just say it. We said at the beginning, we hear what we want to hear. We see what we want to see. We ask the question, what forms are once? Like, we want to ask that, ponder, okay, what's, what's coming behind that? Like, why am I projecting that so much? Why, you know, my, my soapbox, my da-da-da, and is every word being coming from that? But here's the better question, I, we think. Who forms our wants? Rather than we see what we want to see, what's, what, what the wants come from? Who forms our wants? Amen? Yeah. Sorry, I have to <laughs> take the mic. <laughs> in the worst, most painful times of discipline, of the Lord's discipline in my life, there's so much grace. And I can look back at those times and, and see that he drew me closer to himself in that. And I, what was going through my head just now is the psalm, and I'm sorry, I cannot pull the number where, and I think it's David, said, before um, I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. And I think that's exactly what's happening with our, our folks here in uh, the Jeremiah text, that we see the incredible grace and love of the Lord, even in the midst of terrible discipline and and we didn't even get into the things they faced in Babylon and it was awful it was not just some kind of little pleasure trip it was a terrible oppression in the midst of all of that these are the words the Lord says back to them that we where we see his hand in the midst of of discipline and pain that is happening to his people he says here in verse 10 of chapter of Jeremiah chapter 29 Through the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord says, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise, and I will bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, and I will be found by you. I will be found by you, right? Even in the midst of of all the bad stuff that you've done and all the ways, Israel, that you have been unfaithful to me, I will be found by you. I have not forsaken you. I will come and gather you back to myself. And that was some parenthetical there, but verse 14, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. And we see this beautiful phrase right there in the middle of it that you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart 
And, and this seeking is not just a, let's go and ask God for some information. The seeking that he's referring to here is actively desiring to live in fellowship with God. That the seeking is a whole life inclination. That everything about me is pointing Godward, right? That is the kind of seeking that he's talking about. When, I'm, when all of me is invested in following after God that we will find him, and he has already found and held us, right? So when Paul says in Philippians 3.10, you know, I've, I've counted all this, everything about my life, I count as loss, and it's rubbish, by the way, so that I can be in Christ, so that I can be found by Christ, that I might know him, right? That's the kind of knowing that we're talking about here, that I might know him That's experientially, not just That's some kind of head knowledge, but that I would experience yes. the God of creation. Amen. Amen. Rather than, uh, sorry, you know, rather than just the information, I want to, I want to know him. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord with our whole being. Church, this is our call. This is our invitation. Don't hold back. Seek the Lord. What's God doing today? He's inviting us to seek him. He's not, it's not about fortune telling. It's not about psychics. It's about Jesus, the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Pastor Bob, I'm going to invite you, if you would, I'm going to have you pray over us and if you have any final thoughts. But uh, was this helpful, y'all? Like, I just, Pastor Bob, you're such a blessing to us. And um, uh, what, a, what a gift you are. So. Father, we are so grateful this morning for the opportunity to share the word of the Lord as you have allowed us to see it. But Father, we also realize that there are many that are also receiving the knowledge and the wisdom that comes from the scripture. And so today, as a part of this great community, this great ones that know you and are loving you, we just pray that the Spirit of the Lord would continue to guide and direct, give wisdom. Father, let us continue to have the joy and the peace that comes from knowing you as our Lord and Savior. Bless today in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? Yeah. Congregation, I bless you today. And Esther, again, thank you for worshiping with us. I'm anticipating what God's doing beautiful things. May I bless you in the name of the Lord, our God and Savior, the one who is speaking and communicating, the one that has made it possible for you to hear from the Lord, from the Spirit. I bless you, church, family. Be strengthened by his grace. In the name of the Father and the Son, his blessed Holy Spirit. Church, to God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Pastor Bob, again, thank you. Praise God.